So we start with our manager, Sumugi Takanashi, and Banri. Wait, hold on. Where have I seen you from? Never mind. It's her first day on the job at her father's talent agency, and already she's been placed in the hot seat. Congratulations, Miss Takadashi. You're now the manager of seven idols. They're just downstairs playing basketball. So for a quick intro, the red-headed fellas Riku. From the looks of it, he's a little bogged down from playing, but I think it's fine. These are the Izumi brothers, Iori and Mitsuki. He's Nagi. For some reason, he speaks in this weird accent. Hello, Lokuya Nagi desu. Hello, MTV. Welcome to my crack. Yamato's appearance stands out mostly because of his really small irises. Tamaki's only noteworthy trait is that he likes king pudding. And finally, Sogo doesn't seem like he has much going for him at all. For now. And, you know, for a group of total strangers her father plucked off the street, they seem to be getting along well enough. Sumugi thinks so too, as she already sees the potential in these guys. But then her father says he'd rather have a three-man idol group. After spending some time pondering, she finally responds with the The seven samurai are cooler than the three little piggies, dad! And so, the group is now official, and they spend the rest of that day thinking of a name. Till they land on Idolish Seven. <laughs> Also, her father wanted a seven-member group from the start. That trolling asshole. <laughs> Around this time, we're introduced to Trigger, a three-man idol group that's been on the rise over the past year. And in their short time in the spotlight, they've already achieved quite a lot, winning several awards and receiving widespread attention from all over. The likes of Gaku Yaotome, Tsunashi Ryunosuke, and Ten Kujo are a force to be reckoned with. As for the new guys, they aren't debuting just yet. The strategy is to generate some hype behind them, so before a proper debut, they want their first concert to be as a sort of teaser for this up-and-coming group. In preparation, Sumugi spends her efforts on making a website, hosting photo shoots, and handing out flyers. But the boys think that she's putting too much stress on herself and decides to help her out. Word about Idolish 7 is starting to spread around, and more people are visiting their website. This seems to be going well, so I assume a lot of people will be at that concert, right? Oh no. Despite the disappointing news, Idolish 7 are thankful for their manager's efforts. Before their show, they appoint Yamato as the leader, and they do their first group handshake. Trigger happens to hear their show from afar. They're impressed, but not deterred. Their president most likely wants them to squander any potential growth for this new group. After the show, Iori meets with Sumuki and offers to help manage Idolish 7 with her. She gives him the green light, and so, his first move as an assistant manager, put a halt to all idol activities until they watch a Trigger concert that's a few months out. That includes singing and dancing, even if it's for recreation's sake. He believes that they need to seek stimulation from the experts. And well, <laughs> considering their behavior since that first concert, yeah, yeah. In the meantime, they all settle into their new dorms and quirky hijinks ensue. No! No! This return will kick you out! I come for this box! Shut up! Beyond that, we get some insight into why these guys became idols. For Riku, it has something to do with Trigger. And my money's on him having beef with someone there. Tamaki simply wants to be on TV. Yamato's here for revenge, no elaboration here. Nagi's, well, <laughs> just Nagi. And Sogo, while not outright saying why, did mention that he abandoned his family to get here. Iori's here to help Mitsuki achieve his dream of being one. Mitsuki hoping one day he'll be like his childhood hero. That being Zero. In his day, Zero captured the hearts and minds of millions all over. He was world-renowned, and he even had an arena that shared his namesake. But out of nowhere, he suddenly vanished at the height of his popularity. No one has heard from him since, and the arena's abandoned along with it. Maybe the fame got to him, or there was something else even bigger than him at play here. But that's in the past. His legacy has become an inspiration to many such as Mitsuki, and these people wish to stand where he once stood, or in some cases, outright surpass him. On the day of the concert, everyone meets up outside the venue but notices that Nagi, Tamaki, and Yamato are missing. They're running late because apparently they got involved in a bombing. <laughs> hey, where are you going? Hello? 
It's around here that Riku reveals that Ten is his long-lost twin brother. I mean, well, I had a real hard time telling if he didn't know. And on that bombshell, the other three find Ten out on the street. He's not looking so good, but Ten insists that they deliver him to the concert. As they transport him, we get some insight into his philosophy as an idol. He's someone who's willing to compromise a lot to make the fans happy. Including, but not limited to, his physical health as we see before us. His own agency doesn't really matter, because the smiles and cheers of the fans are all he needs. As he says, as Yamato pointed out, Ten acts differently on and off camera. Usually he comes off stone cold and a bit ruthless as we'll see later, but once on camera he's suddenly the nation's sweetheart. To say he has a perfectionist attitude towards his job is a massive understatement, but then again, uh, <laughs> I'd hate to hear the lecture he'd give me if he found out how I run this YouTube channel. Once the concert's over, Sumugi lifts the ban, so the boys finally let loose out on the venue, attracting a small crowd. That immediately backfires as herself and Yamato go to Yaotome Productions to apologize for the scene they caused. Trigger's manager thought they were self-advertising or something. They spot Ten at the lobby and, well, he's fine with what happened. But when asked about Riku being his twin brother, he warns them that he has a fatal flaw. If Riku's coughing throughout the previous four episodes wasn't a dead giveaway, he has a respiratory disorder. Iori caught one of this quite early, but he realizes how valuable Riku's singing is to the team. So he tells him this. If his asthma takes him down, everyone else gets taken with him. Their next performance at a train station is already hectic. A storm is ravaging the city, and the place is packed with commuters waiting for their trains. Riku insists on performing till the trains are back on, despite the obvious health risk. Still, they finish the two hours worth of performing, and he's barely holding on. <laughs> After a horrific nightmare, he awakens to Samugi by his side. She's done some research on his condition, and she's worried for him. Yet she still wants him as part of the team, and swears to do everything in her power to keep him safe. For now though, Iori plans to have the group perform at the same venue as their very first show, confident that word about Idolish 7 has spread enough. You know, at this point, this guy's just running this whole show, um, Samugi's parroting whatever he says. Anyways, uh, they huddle around a laptop with a webpage for their concert bookings. The goal is to have 3,000 tickets sold. Everyone's on edge, hoping that the tickets sell out. As soon as the sale goes live, the website crashes. Which only means one thing. As they prepare for their concert, Riku stares at the overcast sky. He swears to himself that he'll give all of his might on stage, even if it means collapsing. He's quickly reminded, if he falls, everyone goes down with him. There are 3,000 people out there and a TV crew to boot, so don't mess this up. The group do their usual handshake, and they all vow to give everything they got. The first song goes without a hitch. Nice. On their second song, rain starts to pour on stage. Um, it's fine, just get your raincoats out. As the show marches on, thunder and lightning crash in the distance, and soon after... A power outage. Lights? Gone. Sound 2. They won't be back on for a while. Samugi's scrambling around to see if they can get any backup power. Meanwhile on stage, they're contemplating on ending the show right here. But then they remember Ten's wisdom. Tamaki, get your ass on stage! The TV crew were just about to cancel the broadcast, but Samugi insists that they leave the cameras running. It's now Solko's cue to finish up the show. And with that, they wrap up a wonderful night despite all the troubles. Samugi falls to her seat with a shaky breath, completely relieved that everything miraculously worked out. The success from last night led i7's popularity to skyrocket, Tamaki and Sogo receiving the most attention due to their, um, <laughs> bro moment together. As a result, they both receive offers to be on national television. Tamaki, of course, says yes, as he thinks their popularity will trickle down to the others. Sogo wants to wait on other opportunities, as it's more fair. They have differing ideas on what's best for the group, so they have a physical disagreement. 
Yeah, Soko's had enough, so he decides to just leave for a bit, and Tamaki chases after him. In all honesty, I do support Tamaki's decision. Assuming that the idol scene in Japan is a highly volatile environment, if they want to get their name out there, they should pounce at every opportunity they can get. But the factor of him just wanting to be on television makes him come off as a bit selfish too. So while, yes, it makes sense from one standpoint, Tamaki seems like he's only in it for himself. As the two walk out on the street, the president of Yao Tome Productions approaches them. He wants them to debut under his agency. Apparently, Sir John Yao Tome has a dossier on Tamaki. He wants to be an idol because it might help him find his younger sister, Aya. So he makes an offer, be with his team, and they can make him famous and find her. <laughs> you know what Tamaki is going to say. But Soko drags him out before he has a chance to say yes. He still pleads with Soko to join Yatome Productions with him. And so, the comments I made about Tamaki literally 30 seconds ago still apply. Tamaki tells the others that he's quitting, and of course they're furious. Soko has them tell the truth, and they're all like, Man, you could've just started with that! Yamato suggests maybe if they debut as one, it could help Tamaki's search. So they have debut talks with their president, and he says yes. With a catch. To protect the Idolish 7 from Yaotome, unfortunately only Tamaki and Soko will be debuting. But good news, the music festival aptly named Music Festa is around the corner. This could be their chance to prove themselves to the president. Meanwhile, Mr. Yaotome, absolutely fuming at the prospect of competition, thinks that Trigger's songwriting is not up to par with i7. So he sends out his best writer to try and make a song better than them. So now the question remains, who exactly is writing for Idolish 7? Nagi might know since he drops the name Haruki. Jumping ahead to Music Festa, the writer that Yaotome sent out is ransacking Idolish 7's green room. Hey buddy, I think you got the wrong door. The writer's room's two blocks down. Riku spots him and he makes a break for it, stomping on an inhaler on the way out. Oh no. W worse still, they're on in 15 minutes due to a schedule change. They all try to make the best of the situation as they walk on set. Riku's already coughing on camera, but they pay no mind to it. As their song plays, Iori's thoughts are circling him. He's worried should Riku make a mistake or have an attack on live TV. He's thinking about maybe covering for him, or having one of the others do that for him. Okay, but none of that matters right now because your line's coming up. Iori drops the ball big time. And to place a drop of salt on that gaping wound triggers right after them. As they get on stage, Ten gives Riku a ghastly stare. A harsh reminder that he has no place in a world of professionals. Watching Trigger's performance brings their hopes down even more. Witnessing their perfect synchronicity, compared to their shameful discordance, becomes too much for them, especially for Iori. He runs off to the Zero Arena, a place he used to take Mitsuki when he was feeling down. Once the others find him, he breaks down into tears, believing that he single-handedly ruined everything. Samugi pins the blame on herself, saying she wasn't fully prepared for such a hectic day. This is the lowest they've ever been, but Nagi reminds them that it's not so over just yet. This is just one of the many bumps on their long road to building their legacy. I'm still quite annoyed that Riku didn't mention the shoddy guy leaving their green room. It may have not been a priority then, but just give everyone else, especially your manager, a heads up. After that whole cock up, Tamaki and Sogo officially debut under the name Mezzo. But first, they need a quick break from the stresses of idol work. They're sent off to a retreat in the woods to think about what they've done and how they can improve. But for newly formed Mezzo over here, these two don't exactly see eye to eye 90% of the time, so it's best they try settle their differences right now. Also, if you're wondering where Nagi's accent's from, it's because he's half Japanese. Okay, well, okay, you can tell that obviously, so what's his other half? Although not technically Danish, I'm still giving Nagi crap for simply being associated with <laughs> Europe's dry cum stain. Let's see how Metzo's doing real quick. <laughs> Eh, could be worse. To wrap up the night, they play a wholesome drinking game and alcoholic hijinks ensue. Yamato remembers that he's in a show marketed towards women and, as part of the game, risks everything to sleep on Tsumuki's lap. Peace. Now this seems appropriate to point out. Since this is a male idol anime, a genre with a predominantly female audience, don't be surprised if the writers experiment with, uh, 
tight male bonds. Mm. I think for this episode in particular, they play it up for laughs because they're all drunk, but there are sprinkles of it in episodes prior, especially between Riku and Iori. <laughs> Also, since Samogi is meant to be a stand-in for the viewer, the writers also like to experiment with the idea of a reverse harem. They're all the usual suspects for shows like these, but for me personally, I kind of just don't care because I've kind of gotten used to it and they kind of lighten it up in later seasons. Nope, scrap that, I rewatched season 2 and I forgot that these two exist, uh, Jesus. While we're here, let's spend some time on the music as well. I've yet to listen to every Idolish 7 song, it's because the madness hasn't kicked in right now. With that in mind, when watching this show, Fast Forward was on speed dial every time a song came on. I, I know, preposterous, right? Watch an idol anime, skip all the performance scenes, lock the man up, he is going away for a long time. Okay, well, I did listen to a few songs in my spare time. Monster Generation is the group's very first song they perform, and the real reason why I haven't uploaded in months is because I've been putting this song on repeat while telling myself it's not good. Other songs I've listened to include Mezzo's Forever Note, which is an okay song. The opening track for Season 3 Part 2 deserves a thumbs up from me, and there's also Fly Away, which kind of sounds like future funk if you drop that a semitone. Also, the original score for the anime is serviceable to a degree, but there's a specific track in there that makes my mind go blank. With Mezzo now fully established, the fans are split on their debut. Some were happy for them, and some gave angry phone calls at 3am. Riku's happy that, for the most part, the fans reflect how the rest of them feel. It's a strangely comforting thought, and he's hopeful everyone else can debut. For the time being, the focus of Idolish 7 has shifted away from concerts to their new web show, Idolish Night With You. Along with that, they're looking for more avenues to spread the good word. Iori recommends that Yamato take up on acting roles, but he seems very... apprehensive about it. Even when he's presented with work from a primetime drama director, he's all... Don't care. When Tsumugi confronts him, Yamato goes all mysterious man on her, fully taking advantage of the fact that he is indeed in a male idol show. In a late night practice session with Mitsuki, he says something that makes Yamato change his tune. As far as we know, Yamato has always been the nonchalant type, and at times reluctant. When he was elected as leader all the way back, it wasn't because he had any defining leadership traits, it was simply because he was the oldest. Despite that, he still takes on the challenge of being a leader anyways. He also tried to leave all the way back in episode 1. He clearly does care about the others, yet he has his own motivations. But seeing the others, especially Mitsuki, work so earnestly and passionately towards their goals, he decides to take one for the team and go for that drama role. Things are looking on the up and up right now. Yamato's acting gig brought more eyes onto i7, and the web show is doing quite well. More importantly, it's time that Idolish 7 finally makes steps towards debut. They're cast off to Sunny, formerly war-torn Okinawa, to film a promo video. Metso has a busy schedule, so they have things to do there as well. Today we also learned that Metso has an official gang sign. After their shoot, Tamaki is approached by a TV producer. He offers to help Tamaki find Aya, and he takes up on the deal despite Sogo's disapproval because of course he would. I'm not sure if it's common for shows like this, but I noticed how there's considerable screen time spent on the people running behind the scenes work. You know, camera crews, sound guys, producers, directors, the works. Unlike this instance with this guy, their inclusion doesn't necessarily move the story forward. But it's nice that they shed light and pay respects to the invisible people that make these works of entertainment possible. It's not meta because it's not really an anime about making anime, like how there are films about filmmaking. It's more seeing one form of Japanese entertainment through the lens of another, if that makes sense. Oh, and the show also spends time on the lives of the fans as well, showing their heartbreak, joy, and unwavering loyalty. In the context of this show, their roles story-wise are pretty minuscule, but their inclusion serves as a great reminder that these people help make the dreams of an idol possible. Trigger happens to be in Okinawa with them too, so naturally, Riku's first instinct is to raid the penthouse to have a nice little reunion. But guess what? Wrong door, dumbass. That's THE Gaku Yaotome, son of Sir John Yaotome. Have a chat with a nice fella, won't you? The others were watching closely till Ten spots them. <laughs> Dance is a little bit of 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 a
Once they return from Okinawa, they find that their whole office has been ransacked. Yaoto and his minions successfully snatched a demo tape of their debut song. Now that song is a trigger song from here on out. So, what now? The boys try to perform it in front of a crowd, while Trigger's advert played on a Jumbotron nearby. That's bound to leave some confusion. Even with the setback, Idolist 7 manages to properly debut with Monster Generation as their debut single. They're correct in assuming that either Trigger or Yaotome Productions were responsible for their actual debut single going missing. As appealing as a lawsuit sounds, they could receive a defamation countersuit. On a more positive note, i7's web show has been upgraded to a proper late night show. Never mind, um, but hey, at least their debut tour went without a hitch. Metzo isn't having a great time right now. Being a part of two units, doing different things at different times and different places, is starting to take its toll on both of them. This all leads to a breaking point where Tamaki misses work because a fan led him astray, saying she knows where his sister is. She wanted him to go as far as introducing her as his girlfriend on live TV. This is intercut with Soko being berated by a producer for Metzo's unprofessionalism. He says that they could get replaced in a heartbeat and... Afterwards, they don't hear from Sogo for a few hours, so Riku checks his dorm to find him on the floor collapsed. Episode 13 is when Sogo finally reveals the details. He's very familiar with the folks who blacklisted their show, the FSC, because he's the son of the chairman. And the reason he abandoned his family is because they were all opposed to him pursuing music. They believe he should have stuck to his studies and hopefully got a nice job. Sogo's uncle tried to follow a life of music. He got nowhere and passed away a bum. But that's how Sogo's family saw it, as they practically disowned him. At his funeral, they all passed his coffin saying, I told you so, over and over again. Why pursue something as futile and as unsustainable as music? For Sogo, however, his uncle's death wasn't in vain. The man lived his best life doing what he loved. When he died, he died a happy man and nothing else. With Sogo being an idolish 7, he's been given a chance to pursue what he really enjoys, and carry on the will of his late uncle. I remember joking about how Sogo, as a character, seemed like the least interesting when I started watching. I now take it back. Okay, well, I took it back during episode 9 with the knife bit and him being drunk, but that's besides the point. Sadly, we don't get to see this aspect of Sogo develop much this season. But seeing his development all the way up to season 3 made me let out a few... That's my boy! That's why he's the GOAT! Among other compliments. We're with Trigger now, and Ten seems skeptical of their new hit single. It's oddly similar to i7's music. But for the moment, Gaku seems more interested in Ten's past. Why did he leave his family? And who exactly did he leave them for? Ten won't let up. He's not down to chat about some petty personal problems with some below-par plebeian. After all, they're business partners, not friends. And besides, Simogi interrupts and they force feed her cake. Okay, seriously. Ten makes an offer to Simogi. Win the JIMA New Artist Award, the one that Trigger won last year, then he will tell Riku everything he wants to know. i7's next big performance is at Soundship. Trigger's here as well, and Gaku sends his best wishes to the team. However, there's already bad news. Trigger's performance is cancelled, some complications with the higher-ups and all that. Reasonably, they're pissed. Nearly everyone who came today are Trigger fans, and to fail on their most important tenant, over something out of their control no less, must be a major blow to their morale. Since there's now a huge gap in the program, with a huge crowd waiting for one particular group, who's going to close out the show? Any takers? On stage, they're immediately met with the cries of those who came to see Trigger. Tamaki wants to share how he feels about the situation. Shit, wait, wait, wait! <laughs> They close out the show by performing Trigger's song, the one that's technically theirs. Fans of Trigger are still displeased with these circumstances, but gradually, i7 win them over as they begin to sing along with them. While Ten watches the broadcast, he finally shows his brother some well-deserved respect. Meanwhile, Surge on Yaotome is pretty damn livid right now, so he sends his minion to write a better song in the same style. Oh no. <laughs> The Metzo boys stop by the office to collect their things, but Sogo notices something's amiss. They aren't alone. <laughs> Apparently, Tamaki's fine, but Sogo, let's just say... <laughs> 
Even with the stolen song problem solved, should Trigger fans find out that their summer song was indeed not theirs, that would be a massive headache for everyone involved, so it's best to not make the situation public. Otoharu decides to have a chat with Mr. Yaotome about ethics. Man, man, you gotta chill with the shady business practices, man. Shut up. Also, your wife died. How's your marriage, asshole? Also, your son hates you. Fuck off. <laughs> Afterwards, Gaku tries to get some answers from his father, but he's not in the mood right now. Jesus, now he's really hellbent on taking out I-7. His strategy now is to tear them apart from within by having the press spread rumors about them. This, along with the fact that the boys are hardly together most of the time, is creating complications. Without a direct line of communication, they can only ever hear of each other through gossip. When they do get together, things escalate rather quickly. Although this press extravaganza kinda just comes and goes this season, it also doubles as some great foreshadowing for later seasons. Not everyone is safe from the rumors. Not even Nagi. It's only a matter of time before each one of these members gets into some big drama that sprouted from this hearsay. But the cruel irony of it all, as dirty as this play is, Yaotome Sr. is going to have a taste of his own medicine at some point down the road. So, when that day comes, good luck and have fun, because you had it coming. As for his son, Gaku takes Simugi out for questioning. He wants to know the true nature of the summer song. Riku pops in out of nowhere to say yes. That song was their debut single, and it got stolen. And Trigger has been performing an Idolish 7 song this whole time. Gaku takes this newfound information to the others. Ten already knew, but he withheld that from them. In a rare moment of vulnerability, he says that he didn't tell them to avoid hurting them, regardless of how shameful his actions were. Gaku and Ryu see how full of regret he is and comfort him. Remember that TV gig that Tamaki accepted a while back? It's finally time they filmed that. But here's the catch. They couldn't find Aya, so they got the next best thing. <laughs> they got lucky this time. Had this been live, Idolish 7 would have been dead in the water. But hey, on the bright side, they just got nominated for the new Artist Award thingy. Yay, congrats, I guess. Back at their dorm, Otoharu chimes in. Idolish I7, nor Trigger are having the best time right now, and everyone just so happens to congregate at the Zero Arena. Each member having a moment of reflection, and sharing what's on their mind with one another. Riku finally has a heart-to-heart -heart with Ten. He's still quite sad that he left him all those years ago. But what he lost as someone he looked up to, in turn he gained a tough rival that he could happily battle. The twins shake hands as a sign of respect for one another. Back at HQ, they wonder how they can reconcile with the president. Nagi thinks that the reason why Otoharu disbanded them is because the songs they sing hold significant value. And with the way they're feeling right now, maybe it's best to hold off on that. Hang on, who actually writes these songs? Nagi, of course! Okay, jokes. It's actually a dear friend of his. One that he mentioned briefly back in episode 7. Sakura Haruki. Or, as the others know him for, the man who wrote Zero songs. Nagi was befriended by Haruki during his youth in Northmare who came here to search for Zero following his disappearance. Somewhere down the line, Haruki got sick and, as a parting gift, enlisted Nagi to give his work to someone who deeply cared about music. Speaking of that someone, Otoharu chimes in again. He takes them to where they once did a street performance. He's not there to berate the boys again, instead telling them to keep their head high. Remember, they've been nominated for Best New Artist. Many would give anything to be in the spot the boys are in, so they should be grateful for what they achieved in such a short time. And finally, don't let the noise and negativity stop you in your tracks. Meanwhile, Trigger wants to share a few kind words with their president. <laughs> it's Jaima night now. I-7 are now in the home stretch. They've been given flowers from people who deeply respect them and wish them the very best. There's even one from Trigger. There's also one that doesn't have a name, so they play pretend with who gave them those flowers. Iori says that those flowers came from his past self who fumbled during Music Festa. He's still quite pressed over that, 
But everyone reassures him that everything all worked out in the end. Right now is a pivotal moment for the seven of them. Idolish seven do their usual ritual, and they give it their all. Japan Idol Music Award, Shinjin Showa, Idolish Seven. Yeah, they may have won the new artist award, but they still need to settle a score with those other three at the annual Black or White concert. Whoever wins is decided by the people. The two teams meet backstage and wish each other the best. Trigger's performing first, so now's a good time to reflect on why they became idols. It's been a long and arduous journey for the Seven, one without an end in sight. They may have started out of their own selfish motives, but seeing the joy that they bring to people and being in the presence of a great team makes it even more worth it for them. Since whoever wins is a crowd vote, there's only one way to win this. To show everyone that deep down in their heart that this, this is what they truly, sincerely love doing. By a hair, and only by a hair, Idolish 7 wins the male idol category. Cheers and tears fill the arena as everyone's joyful over their victory. Trigger, despite their loss, congratulate their efforts and vow to beat them next time. And that, for now, is Idolish 7. Coming soon! Sogo threatens Tamaki with a power drill, Riku's asthma gets worse, and Nagi stops speaking in that accent.